Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. So today our topic is gastroesophageal reflux disorder or disease um, with Dr. Steven Sandberg-Lewis. And this condition occurs in up to 20% of Americans. GERD, also known as acid reflux, is a condition where the contents from the stomach come back up into the throat, resulting in a burning or acidic taste in the mouth, burning pain in the chest, vomiting, breathing problems, chronic cough, chronically bad breath, chronic laryngitis, and erosion of the teeth. This can uh, eventually lead to, um, uh, <clears throat> this can eventually lead to chronic inflammation of the esophagus, esophageal strictures or narrowing of the esophagus, Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition, and it can even lead to esophageal cancer. I'm, I'm very excited that we have one of the top functional medicine doctors to join us for a discussion on this important topic, Dr. Steven Sandberg-Lewis, or Dr. SSL, as his patients often call him. Dr. Sandberg-Lewis has been a practicing naturopathic physician for nearly 40 years, specializes in, specializing in gastrointestinal disorders. He teaches gastroenterology at the National College of Natural Medicine. He lectures around the world, or at least he used to when we used to have in-person meetings, and hopefully we will soon. And he wrote an awesome medical textbook, Functional Gastroenterology, which is now in its second edition, and everybody should pick that up. So Dr. SSL, uh, you have the floor. All right. Thanks. Uh, nice to join you on, on your uh, discussion here. And... Uh, I'll share my screen. I just made a little short PowerPoint to give us a kind of a place to start. All right. So, um, I find that reflux and heartburn and regurgitation uh, are things that aren't always very well understood, even by well-versed physicians. So uh, I have a few basic things here to just point out. Um, according to the GI physiology books, reflux is a normal occurrence, uh, apparently up to three minimal uh, reflux events from the stomach into the lower esophagus are considered physiologic after meals. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has significant reflux because if it's only a small amount, if there's adequate saliva to buffer it, if there is normal motility in the esophagus, which there are these contractions that can occur that don't require a swallow called secondary contractions that help to move the refluxed material back down into the stomach. And um, a number of other protective mechanisms that keep it from causing any, any real symptoms. So, uh, just to know that it, it can be physiological to have some reflux, although if it becomes uh, more severe, larger volumes and uh, lasting longer, and the protective factors aren't there, it can, it can start to, to cause GERD. And, um, you know, the, the term gastroesophageal reflux disease 
really means reflux that leads to either symptoms, injury to the mucosa, such as erosive esophagitis, or both. So, you know, there's normal, there's normal reflux that doesn't lead to disease. Now, now um, are there specific criteria for um, diagnosing GERD, or can it be diagnosed simply by symptoms? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. It's a, it's a great question. I'll, I'll come back to that. So um, there don't need to be esophageal lesions, erosions, ulcerations, or Barrett's esophagus, or any changes like that in order to diagnose reflux, because there's something called NERD, non-erosive reflux disease, where people have significant reflux, but they don't have any biopsy-based changes or even gross visible changes on upper endoscopy. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, and it is true that the majority of people with even true reflux, true GERD, don't show any visible abnormalities on upper endoscopy, and that's the NERD. So if someone has significant symptoms of heartburn and they're going to get worked up because it's not getting better or there's a concern that they may be developing complications, the way to really find out if someone has reflux is to do some combination of the following four tests. So the first one would be upper endoscopy, looking at the esophagus, the stomach, and at least the first two portions of the duodenum, EGD, based uh, for, for short. And, uh, you know, that's a great way to differentiate whether there's any uh, reflux esophagitis or not, whether it's NERD or GERD. Uh, it's a way to check for gross or microscopic changes that might be intestinal, uh, intestinal metaplasia or Barrett's esophagus. Um, and really, that's Barrett's esophagus is, is pretty much related to the esophagus trying to protect itself from this chronic inflammation and irritation from reflux that's occurring on a regular basis. Um, and of course, the biopsy would also show if Barrett's is moving more toward cancer, uh, if you start to see dysplasia um, and, and especially advanced or severe dysplasia, which is a stage right before cancer of the esophagus and then uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. The, the good news is that even with Barrett's, especially in women, if they have Barrett's, uh, the risk of getting cancer of the esophagus is, is something like 1%. Um, so it's, it's a low risk, but much higher risk than, of course, if they didn't have chronic reflux. And um, there are things we can do to help prevent that and reverse it. So that's a lot of what I do with, with patients. Then there's uh, esophageal manometry, which measures to see if the contractions in the, of the esophagus are normal, whether they have a esophageal motility disorder, um, which could cause similar symptoms, even if there isn't reflux. And then there's the 24 hour pH impedance test. Sometimes it's called a Bravo test. And it's an indwelling um, pH meter that shows how often in a 24 hour period the person is having reflux and whether the, the reflux is acidic, neutral, or even alkaline, which is all really good information. And then it also allows the patient to push a button just like a halter monitor for uh, cardiac issues. It allows them to push a button whenever they have symptoms of heartburn and then we can see if there's a correlation between their symptoms and the reflux. And all those things are helpful for actually truly knowing if the person's problem is related to reflux. And then there's a gastric emptying study that measures to see how much food remains in the stomach at each hour over a four hour period. Take an x-ray each hour 
and see how much of the test meal is left in the stomach. And of course, delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis is uh, a major cause of severe reflux and nausea and or vomiting and pain. So this is the kind of workup that at least the manometry, the upper endoscopy and the 24 hour pH impedance would be done for any patient that is considering getting uh, Nissen fund application or other uh, surgery for reflux. Because the last thing a surgeon wants to do is do a surgery for somebody who really doesn't have reflux. So you don't, you've got to prove they have it in order to do a surgery that's only going to work for reflux. And um, so these are, these are things to consider. You may have patients that have had heartburn for decades and they've been on proton pump inhibitors for decades and they want to get off. And, you know, that's a reasonable thing to do to help them wean if you know what they have, if you know exactly, you know, do they have reflux and what kind of reflux? So we'll talk about different kinds. Uh, just a quick slide to show the LA classification of erosive esophagitis or reflux uh, esophagitis. And, uh, you know, grade A is just these little breaks in the tissue that um, th they talk about the, the uh, percentage of the circumference that's affected and how, how long the uh, fissures are or erosions are. And you can see with grade C and D, you're getting uh, much more erosion occurring. And, and it becomes more of a circumferential uh, issue. And these are things that show up on upper endoscopy. The clinical manifestations, um, Ben gave us a nice overview. I, I just wanna differentiate between heartburn and regurgitation. Not everybody has regurgitation, even if they have reflux into the lower esophagus. Regurgitation I define as the rising of the gastric contents into the throat or mouth, um, you know, which is a unpleasant experience. Some people call it, you know, vomiting into their mouth and then swallowing it again. And, um, you know, that's regurgitation. Whereas uh, heartburn often is more of a angina-like, you know, precordial experience, substernal experience uh, that um, doesn't necessarily rise into the throat. And yeah, and regurgitation then, without having GERD? Well, yes. Uh, I, I didn't put a slide in about that, but it's a good question. And there is a condition that I'd really like you all to know that is not reflux, and it, but it does cause regurgitation. Um, it's called rumination syndrome. Please don't um, mix this up with vomiting or reflux. Uh, you know, uh, there is some reflux involved in it, but it's, it's a whole different thing. And you don't see it very often, but um, I've had at least five or 10 patients over the years that have um, rumination syndrome. And, you know, if you think of it, a ruminant animal like a, a cow, they chew their cud. They've got a stomach that has four chambers. They swallow the they swallow the grass, and it stays in the stomach. Goes through different chambers of the stomach. It's ground up. It, then they regurgitate it back into the mouth, and they chew it again for a while. You know, and then they swallow it again. So this rumination is the ability to have food come back up from the stomach into the mouth. And this happens in some people and when it's involuntary. I mean, some people actually have control over it and they use it, I guess, to make money uh, taking drugs across the border because they can swallow them and then bring them back up again. I think they're called mules, those people. But most people, it's an unpleasant thing that they can't control. And so they're eating a meal and they'll say, you know, all of a sudden, 10 minutes after a meal or a half hour after a meal, my food 
starts coming back up into my mouth and it's really embarrassing. And, you know, I'm in the middle of doing a lecture and, I, you know, it's terrible. So rumination syndrome is a whole separate thing from this. And usually with rumination syndrome, what comes up doesn't feel like acid, doesn't feel like it's burning. It's just their food coming back up. And I, I won't go into any more detail about it, but um, sometimes I've seen patients like this and the diagnosis they've got from previous physicians is persistent vomiting. It's not vomiting. There's no nausea and there's no retching. You know, there's no muscular contraction that's felt and there's no nausea. So what causes, hard. what causes that condition? Well, the interest, it's, it's considered to be sort of a, just a, a variety of motility that's a variant of motility. And the, the good news is you can read about this in the Rome Criteria book that talks about all the functional gastroenterology conditions. But uh, the treatment is to learn diaphragmatic breathing and to practice it daily until they really understand how to control their diaphragm. Uh, they, they say at least 100 days in a row, they have to practice this diaphragmatic breathing. And it can really change this pattern because the diaphragm really is the outer, I put, should have put this picture in. The diaphragm really is the outer sleeve of the lower esophageal sphincter. It, when the stomach is in the proper position, if they don't have a hiatal hernia, the two crura or legs of the diaphragm wrap around the gastroesophageal junction and create an outer muscular coat around the lower esophageal sphincter, making it much more functional. That's why if, if someone develops a hiatal hernia and their stomach moves up two or three centimeters, now the lower esophageal sphincter is up here and the diaphragm's down here and they're not working together, they're discoordinated. So the better the, better the functioning of the diaphragm, um, the better um, people will be at being able to keep their food in their stomach and not, not have it rise. So it seems to be quite, quite uh, efficacious treatment. And of course, when you have that hiatal hernia, that's where manual therapy techniques, which uh, you're an expert at, at and teach um, to help pull that um, the stomach down through the diaphragm, right? To, to its proper position below the diaphragm, yeah. Now, Ben also mentioned some extra esophageal symptoms and signs like hoarseness, uh, chronic non-productive cough, uh, asthma that seems to get aggravated by, by reflux, uh, symptoms in the throat, chronic sore throats, uh, even like you said, erosion of dental enamel. I've had some patients whose uh, dentists put, they put coating like a plastic coating on their teeth uh, just to protect it from all the acid so they wouldn't lose their enamel uh, until we actually treated them and then they didn't need that anymore. Uh, chronic sinusitis, even, even chronic otitis. Uh, fascinating thing is that there's research that's quite, was done quite a while ago showing that kids with recurrent otitis media, if they checked the middle ear fluid, they found pepsin in it. So, you know, they're laying down at night and they get reflux and it, the stomach contents go up. They actually end up with pepsin going through the eustachian tube into the middle ear. Wow. And that's part of the irritation in some cases, not every kid. Um, Pulmonary fibrosis, a really feared complication uh, of it, often not known what, what the cause is, but uh, reflux, chronic reflux can really aggravate this and make it uh, progress. Tonsillar hypertrophy. So your patients who have huge tonsils, there's a study that found that uh, reflux can cause the Lingual ton, not the lingual tonsil, the uh, the regular tonsil, pharyngeal tonsil, to increase its mass by three and a half times. Wow! Just that chronic irritation. 
you know, other things can do it too, but that's one of the things that can cause tonsillar hypertrophy. I mentioned the recurrent otitis media and then sleep disturbances, sleep apnea, um, just due to irritation in the throat and swelling. So if you're not aware of LPR, laryngopharyngeal reflux is a form of reflux that uh, is unique. And often these people have no heartburn. They have no symptoms of, of, of heartburn, but instead their symptoms are in their pharynx or larynx. And so they have some of those extra esophageal symptoms that we talked about, like the chronic throat clearing, chronic cough, chronic sore throat, wake up with a sore throat in the morning, every morning, bad breath, uh, globus phenomenon, feeling that there's, there's a ball or something in the throat. Uh, of course, recurrent aspiration pneumonia, because if, you, if you're aspirating some of those stomach contents, which can include everything from acid, pepsin, uh, partially digested food, pancreatic enzymes, and bile from the small intestine, because some people have reflux through the pyloric valve as well. Yeah, that's a pretty irritating thing to breathe into your lungs. And so if you have patients that have recurrent pneumonia, you really have to consider this. Um, if they develop webs or strictures, they can have trouble swallowing, things getting stuck. Um, mention the hoarseness and changes in voice and even airway obstruction where they get laryngospasm and they, they have symptoms like asthma, but really it's more that their larynx is spasming uh, rather than their bronchioles. Uh, so let's talk about some of the, these underlying physiological causes or pathophysiological causes. Um, these are the factors that uh, can really lead to reflux. And you can have combinations of them. It's not just one. People can have two or three of them, and it makes it more complicated when they do. So we mentioned hiatal hernia. And, you know, uh, in sort of standard medicine, hiatal hernia is considered something that can cause reflux and nothing else. Uh, but we know that hiatal hernia can actually cause arrhythmia, including atrial fibrillation, can be a trigger for it. Uh, it can cause a lot of the symptoms that we talked about that are extra esophageal. And we, we uh, got the uh, vagal nerve uh, to heart connection. Yeah, yeah. There are different theories about what it is about having a portion of your stomach pushing against maybe the vagus or pushing against the atria um, that, that may trigger this uh, atrial fibrillation. But in any case, um, hiatal hernia can cause all kinds of symptoms and fatigue and anxiety are two of them. Um, so uh, it's a good idea to check for hiatal hernia uh, with a, at least a functional test in any patient who has persistent anxiety that's not responding is my feeling. Uh, so another thing that can cause symptoms of reflux, heartburn and other reflux symptoms, is anything that decreases the defenses of the, of the mucous membrane. So if they have abnormal saliva, like some people have acidic saliva instead of alkaline saliva. And saliva, think about it, you know, we think about saliva as, as like, it's this thing in your mouth, but really up to one and a half liters of saliva being produced every day by the salivary glands and being swallowed throughout the day, periodically. It's a, that's a lot of functional material, one and a half liters of saliva. And it's got defensins in it, it's got lactoferrin, you know, it helps prevent infection, it helps prevent inflammation, it's got, uh, the alkalinity that helps neutralize any physiologically refluxed, if it's a not excessive uh, amount of reflux. And, you know, the acids from the stomach, assuming the patient has acid in their stomach. And uh, just many, many important functions that it has. 
Uh, so saliva is an important thing. If your patient has Sjogren's syndrome or some other cause of Sika syndrome, they have a dry mouth, uh, that's a risk factor for esophagitis. And uh, of course, having a normal esophageal mucosa, if they already have erosions, um, they're not going to have very good defenses against any reflux material. And why would you have acidic saliva? Is that due to diet? Well, I actually did a talk on the oral biome uh, just last month at a, at a conference, virtual conference. And uh, the, the main reason that we think people have acidic saliva is overgrowth of uh, either porphyromonas or strep mutans in the mouth. So it's an imbalance in the oral flora. So and, porphyromonas, you're talking about P. gingivalis? Yeah, P. gingivalis, thank you, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's thought to be uh, an increase in um, alkaline-producing variant flora and, uh, excuse me, of uh, acid-producing variant flora, which predispose toward cavities and gingivitis and you know, reduce the buffering effect of normal saliva for not, stomach acid. Not to take you too off topic, but are there clinical strategies for um, improving that, changing that? Yeah, have me back. You know, uh, <laughs> I did a whole I did a whole hour on that, and there are lots of great therapies uh, that can help that. I'll tell you the simplest one right off uh, would be to use oil pulling. And you can use either coconut oil or sesame oil, typically. Occasionally, uh, ozonated olive oil is used as well, or ozonated coconut oil. And, um, you know, that's kind of sucking the oil back and forth between the teeth for 15 to 20 minutes each night after you've brushed your teeth. It's the last thing you do, and you just let it stay in there. Uh, you know, after you spit it out, you just let it, the coating that it puts on your teeth and gums stay there. And that can really help to, to reduce the uh, acid producing bacteria and help normalize the biofilms in the mouth. Wow, that's great clinical pearl right there. Yeah, and there are lots of other great uh, treatments too, like glycothymoline. If you know the Edgar Casey's products um, in Virginia Beach, uh, is that Virginia? <laughs> uh, Edgar Casey products, they've been making this uh, glycothymoline product for probably 50 to 75 years. And it's one of the three American Dental Association approved products for uh, an oral rinse to treat gingivitis. So really, if you're not checking your patients for gingivitis, uh, you know, looking for swollen or edematous or red gums or um, uh, people who are having their gums receding. Um, that's a really important thing to do if you're treating any GI disorders because people are swallowing a liter and a half of infected saliva every day, which is inoculating their digestive tract. So it's a really good thing to look for. Somebody asked, is it safe to do oil pulling with coconut oil plus adding essential oils like clove or frankincense? I don't know. I, I didn't research that. I just researched sesame or coconut oil or ozonated olive oil. So, you know, I, I don't see any problem with it, but I don't have any experience with it. Uh Another one would be impaired esophageal clinic clearance. So I talked about that manometry, esophageal manometry test. That would show if someone had a motility disorder. So for instance, if you have a patient with scleroderma or crest syndrome, which is sort of a milder form of scleroderma, they're going to have problems with this because, you know, the, the worst case scenario is called uh, rubber hose esophagus. And that's part of the CREST syndrome, right? C-R-E-S-T. E is for esophageal motility problems. And um, yeah, people with, people with scleroderma have a lot of digestive disorders 
especially reflux and reflux esophagitis, motility disorders of the esophagus, so things tend to get stuck, they have uh, dysphagia, and almost all of them have bacterial overgrowth of the stomach and the small bowel because of the motility disorder of the, the thickening of the tissue. Um, uh, do any of the supplements that we use for motility of the gut help with motility of the esophagus? You know, it's a great question. Um, it ha I have not seen studies on, on prokinetics to help with esophageal motility. I always try to, I try them out, but I don't know that, you know, there, there's no specific esophag esophagus specific uh, prokinetic agent um, because it has a different system of motility than the stomach and the small bowel, which is based on motilin as a hormone and the migrating motor complex. The migrating motor comp complex doesn't seem to have a connection to the esophagus. That's, that's uh, another part of, of vagal function and uh, central functioning. So uh, it's a great question. I don't have a perfect answer for it. Um, next, we have increased intra-abdominal pressure. And as I just mentioned, bacterial overgrowth uh, would be one of those things because gas gets produced by excessive bacteria or archaea making methane or desulfovibrio bacteria and others that make hydrogen sulfide. And all of that can increase the intra-abdominal pressure. And if it's greater than the intrathoracic pressure, things are going to tend to move up much more easily and reflux becomes common. So um, gas is a problem. Uh, pregnancy could be a problem. Luckily, it only lasts a certain amount of time. Uh, and we know that, of course, in, in pregnancy, you also have the hormone relaxin being produced by um, the placenta, which relaxes all the um, ligaments in the body and can also relax the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and lead to more reflux. And the pressure of the enlarging gravid uterus, you know, as it comes up and pushes up against the stomach and pushes it sometimes up through the diaphragm uh, is a perfect way to get a hiatal hernia during pregnancy, especially when you've got that relaxin flowing through your body, uh, making all of your tissues more uh, flexible or, or uh, less elastic and more um, stretchy. Um, also obesity, abdominal obesity, especially apple fat, especially apple fat uh, can increase the pressure. And we know that abdominal obesity is a, a risk factor for reflux and then breath holding. So really important to treat, to teach your patients how to do proper diaphragmatic breathing and, and learn how to feel the, that as a normal way of breathing because people that are doing the shallow thoracic chest breathing um, tend to have issues with changes in pressure between intrathoracic and intra-abdominal and more likely to have reflux. Uh, remember too, Everything kind of heads back to hiatal hernia. I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but uh, breath, breath holding, this is a good thing to check when, when you're actually with your patient or you're watching them on uh, telemedicine. When they talk, listen to the, the sound of their voice. If they kind of talk like this, that means their diaphragm's locked up. And sometimes that's because their stomach is partially above and partially below the diaphragm. It's like a, an hourglass, you know, kind of stomach. And you think about it. Are you going to feel comfortable with diaphragmatic excursion if you've got this space occupying lesion above and below your diaphragm? You know, it's really going to impede for a lot of people that will impede their functioning 
of their diaphragm and they have shortness of breath. They feel like they can't take a full breath. You're not going to teach that person how to do diaphragmatic breathing until you resolve their hiatal hernia. It's just too hard to do. So remember, diaphragm and hiatal hernia, they, they're just intimately related. By, by the way, uh, you have a course available where you teach your man, manual therapy techniques, don't you? Yeah, and, and, and not just the, the hiatal hernia reduction, but also the diaphragmatic uh, technique to help take the spasms out of the diaphragm. Um, yeah, there was a course that was done. I, I actually had a wonderful experience going to um, the Gold Coast of Australia. Oh, Neurola Jacoby. It's part of her. Neurola Jacoby set it up. We had 82 people. Uh, it was way too many people to do a, a manual <laughs> <laughs> training, but it was fantastic. You know, and there were these bank of windows looking out at the beach. It was crazy. It was so good. So you, anyway, go, to, uh, you go to Neurola Jacoby's website and um, you can purchase that course. Yeah. And Neurola is so good at organizing things. It was, it was incredible. Um, anyway. Somebody just asked a question. Have you tried the biocidin oral rinse for improving the oral microbiome? You know, that is another good option. Uh, I haven't used biocidin for that, but I know that they, you know, they have a toothpaste and you know, they, they have a similar approach to gly uh, glycothymolene, which is uh, volatile oils, uh, oh, okay. various volatile oils. So I think that, that um, that's another option. Okay. Uh, next one is reduced LES pressure, you know, tone, uh, and many things can affect that. And, Sometimes it's tobacco use. Sometimes it's um, hypermobility syndrome. So really good to check all your patients for Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility syndrome because by the way, they're much more prone to hiatal hernia. They're much more prone to LES uh, reduced tone. They're more uh, prone to ileocecal valve loss of tone you know, open ileocecal valve, and they're prone to uh, visceroptosis, uh, a tendency for the stomach, small intestine, and colon to prolapse and hang down. And that can really affect function of the digestive tract. So if you have a patient, you find out they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, how does that change your clinical approach? Well, the good news is full-blown Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility syndrome, and there are like seven different forms of Ehlers-Danlos that are, the other six are much more serious and life-threatening. But the hypermobility type is the most common. It's purported to be about 1% in the United States. In some countries uh, and some areas of Africa, there are some tribes that have up to a 48% uh, hypermobility syndrome. Uh, it just It's a genetic kind of a, a finding. And, um, but about 1%. So you're not going to find it that often, but if you do a lot of work with reflux and ileocecal valve and LAS, like I do, you'll, you'll find variants of it in a lot of your patients. And uh, I think that knowing that your patient has, has hypermobility syndrome, I can't say we have many, many excellent treatments for it, but I can tell you some of them. Uh, so by the way, if you want to learn more about this, either have me come back and I'll talk about it, then we can do that, or uh, go to the Ehlers-Danlos, um, I think it's just called Ehlers-Danlos Society website, and they have a physician or healthcare practitioners section of their website. And it tells you how to do a bait and score and how to check for category two, criterion two um, factors as well. There's just a number of different tests. I do this on every new patient on, on my telemedicine visits because you can do it with telemedicine. And it's just a really important thing to know about people. There are doctors that do neurotherapy injections 
that can do injections into the LES. It's, it sounds crazy and scary, wow. but yeah, one of my, my good friends here in Portland, Dr. Alana Gurevich. Uh, oh, yeah. A, yep. I, I just interviewed her, her a few weeks ago. Yeah. My she, podcast. she does injections into the LES for, oh, wow. uh, for patients whose LES tone is poor and aren't responding to other things. I could talk to her about that. Um, but I think even more important is to know what not to do. So I tend to tell these people, use non-force manipulation techniques. Don't, you know, don't become more and more hypermobile by getting high velocity, low amplitude, frequent uh, therapy. And I tell them that- And don't uh, go to yoga. yoga. <laughs> Well, no, you know, yoga is okay. And these are your yoga. If it says that the person's a yoga teacher on their new patient form, you better test them for this because they probably have it because they can do all the things that you see in the books that other people can't do because they're yeah, so no, I'm, I'm sure they could do it safely. I, but, but on the other hand, they probably are not going to benefit from yoga. They will probably benefit from strength training more. Yeah. Well, they, they could benefit, yeah, from strengthening so that they have more support and stability in their joints and, and doing a, a balanced approach, not just, not just stretching. And, uh, and if they need it, injections, whether it's you know, PRP or prolotherapy or stem cell injections can be life-saving for these people, um, as well as, like I say, sort of non-force uh, more uh, uh, of those types of manipulation okay. and baral, baral therapy can be life-saving as well. Baral is so gentle, but it can really improve uh, the positioning and the mobility of the organs with, uh, with respect to one another in the abdomen. Okay. Um, and then last, uh, last two here, uh, we have visceral hypersensitivity. And these are people that perceive per peristalsis as pain. Boy, that's a tough one. There are some treatments for it, um, specifically uh, biofeedback techniques like neurofeedback can be really helpful. Um, there are some pulsed electromagnetic field techniques uh, that can be helpful. And there are some um, drugs like low... Uh, excuse me, uh, low dose naltrexone is sometimes really helpful as well as um, some probiotics. Uh, there are some specific strains of probiotics that have been shown to, to help with visceral hypersensitivity. So, and the, and there's real... at least one study that shows that curcumin is beneficial as well. Somebody oh. asked, uh, what was this baral therapy you were mentioned? Yeah, so baral, B A. R R A L. Uh, Baral was a uh, French osteopath, I believe, who came up with this non-force um, visceral manipulation technique, which is very elegant. And boy, we have some Baral practitioners in Portland that do amazing things. Even I, this is just an aside, but I have a patient who has severe hypermobility syndrome. And um, she, she was moving into uh, kidney failure. She's been at about 60 or 58 on her uh, glomerular filtration rate for many years. And we just kind of watch it and try to prevent any problems. And suddenly she had dropped her GFR dropped down into the 30s low thirties and she was scheduled to meet with a nephrologist. And, you know, we gave her some herbs that we use that are protective for the kidneys. And, but the, the main thing was she went and had this Baral treatment and they found that her renal arteries were being compressed by surrounding organs. And they just did this gentle manipulation and her GFR went back up to, it went, it went up to 58. So it's almost back wow. to, 62 like it was so we're, we're watching that now and um yeah it was just incredible which which strain of probiotics helps with gut hypersensitivity uh 
It's that common, the one that was studied, I believe, um, you can look on probiotic advisor for more of this, but Jeez, uh, a line, I think it's a line, you know, that regular store brand um, was found to be helpful. Okay. And the last one is gastroparesis or delayed gastric emptying. Because if, if you think about it, if the bag is full for long periods of time and doesn't empty through the bottom, through the pylorus into the small intestine, you're much more likely to get reflux up the top into the esophagus. And this is especially common in both type one and type two diabetes. If your patient has type one diabetes and their blood sugar is not super well controlled, they have up to uh, 40, depends on the study you look at, but 40, even 50% risk of getting gastroparesis. So getting a gastric emptying study can be really helpful. Hey doc, can you tip your camera a little bit? Cause when we, uh, on the video, um, your top of your head's getting cut off. There you oh, go. Well, That's good. You don't need to look at me anyway, but yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is our, all the things that can cause reflux symptoms and there are probably more, but these are some, some of the big ones. So the question about acid, is it always too much acid? Well, sometimes it is, but sometimes it ain't. So not all reflux symptoms are due to excess acid. And I just wanna point out here that these same reflux symptoms and even true GERD or NERD can be due to acid reflux. Acid reflux can cause erosive esophagitis or sometimes not. It may cause some, you know, LA grade A, B, C, D uh, erosive esophagitis, or it, it may not. And if it doesn't, we call it NERD, right? Non-erosive reflux disease. But it's not always acid. Sometimes people have neutral reflux and there's a lot of research on this or what's called weekly acid reflux or for short, WAR, <laughs> W-A-R. <laughs> I, I think gastroenterology has some of the best three letter abbreviations of any form of medicine, any specialty. So we've got WAR going on here with uh, weekly acidic reflux. And that can cause reflux symptoms as well, or even neutral pH of seven. Uh, there's even alkaline reflux, which is often related to bile reflux through the pyloric sphincter into the stomach. So you've got bicarbonate uh, from the pancreas and the Brunner's glands of the, of the small intestine membrane coming back up into the stomach together with bile, which may be alkaline, uh, and then you're refluxing that into the esophagus as well. So that can, that can be alkaline reflux. I didn't even mention that there. And then there's functional heartburn, which are people that have heartburn symptoms, identical symptoms, but they actually don't have any reflux of stomach com contents. Um, and it's, it's a different mechanism. What, what is that mechanism? Well, there are a number of theories. Um, one is that, <clears throat> that any pressure in the esophagus, food moving down or uh, secretions, um, anything that causes fullness in the esophagus or a swallowing disorder where, uh, you know, food doesn't make it all the way to the stomach the first time, all of those things can cause symptoms either that feel like burning or symptoms that feel like pain, like angina or chest pain. So there's functional chest pain and functional heartburn. And it's just thought that um, there's also something called dilated intercellular spaces, DIS, dilated intercellular spaces. And this is present in virtually every patient with reflux. It doesn't get reported on a biopsy, on an upper uh, esophageal biopsy, because you need an electron microscope to see it. And they don't typically do that on biopsies. 
They just use light microscopy. And, but it's this spacing out of the epithelial cells that make up the esophagus, that, which are squamous cells. So it's basically leaky gut of the esophagus. And the, the research says it's almost 100% of patients that have any type of heartburn um, or reflux of any cause tend to have this dilated intercellular spaces. So that may, that may sort of make the nerves in the esophagus closer to the surface or more, uh, more likely to be irritated by any secretions in the esophagus. So different theories as to why that, why that occurs. But it's not reflux and it's not gonna respond usually to standard treatments, which are aimed at getting rid of acid. So uh, why heart, heartburn? One reason why heartburn can persist uh, when someone takes a proton pump inhibitor? Well, of course, one reason would be they already had alkaline reflux or non-acid reflux. But if they did have acid reflux, taking a proton pump inhibitor, if it works well, will lead to weekly acidic reflux. And weekly acidic reflux, according to the research, can still cause the same heartburn symptoms, especially if you have dilated intercellular spaces which almost everybody with reflux has. And I just mentioned here that it could also be due to the fact that they didn't have acid reflux in the first place and it was more uh, neutral reflux. So about 40% of people don't respond to PPIs. And this is my put it all together kind of slide, uh, which we can use as a jumping off point for discussing uh, different mechanisms, but patients with heartburn or pyrosis, um, kind of a, a way to think about it. If you think there might, it's been going on a long time and they might have something like Barrett's or precancerous condition or reflux esophagitis that's getting severe, um, you may want to refer for some of these tests. You may want to evaluate for pancreatic function by doing a stool chymotrypsin or a stool elastase fecal elastase. And if it's low, by treating pancreatic insufficiency, sometimes you get a beautiful uh, reduction in reflux. And um, so it's always a good thing to check. And by the way, I, I have a chapter in my book on the pancreas. And in my second edition, I decided, you know, the, the, the cutoff point is less than 200 for elastase. If the stool elastase is under 200, then they have pancreatic insufficiency. And you can you know, use that as a diagnostic code if you want to, if you're a diagnostician. But most patients that you, that you test that have normal elastase, it's greater than 500. You know, and they won't even measure usually. I think GI map is the only lab that will tell you it's 733. You know? Most labs just say greater than 500 because who cares? It's perfect. Um, so if you see a patient, my recommendation, if you see a patient who has like just, uh, just this week, I had a patient whose, uh, fecal elastase was 227. That's only 27 points away from pancreatic insufficiency. And it's 250 points away from ideal level, 275 points away from ideal levels. So you know, I'm probably gonna do a trial with pancreatic enzymes with that patient. And I'm gonna try plant enzymes, plant enzymes plus brush border enzymes, pork-based, you know, porcine, pancreatin. I'm gonna try several different ones before I give up and say, uh, this isn't helping because they're all very different. And I wrote a blog, if you, if you go to um, Hive Mind Medicine, I put my website on the first slide hmmpdx.com, Hive Mind Medicine, Portland, PDX. Um, there's a blog that I wrote explaining the, about the different types of pancreatic enzyme and brush border enzymes and my theories on, you know, why that's important and how you have to try different ones because they work in different pH ranges. 
Uh, so don't give up if, if your patient has a, definitely if they have below 200 or if they're approaching 200, give it a good try with a number of different enzymes and different potencies before you give up. What, what brush border enzyme product do you like? Uh, oh, this is, it, this is a place where we can talk about that. Yep. Okay. So no see you. where I can't do that. Right. Uh, so Claire labs makes a product called Sibzymes. S I B B stands for small intestine brush border. Sibzymes. Huh. And I've had very nice results with that. Um, there is a product by apex energetics that is also, I, f I don't remember the name of it because I don't use it that much, but I uh, occasionally have patients that are already taking it. And it, it's uh, a combination of a, a bunch of different brush border enzymes. And uh, I've had people do really well with that too. So those are a few. Okay, good. And then, you know, products like many of the plant enzyme products will have brush border enzymes in addition to pancreatic enzymes. They just kind of throw some in. Like well, what, what is some of the names that we should be looking for? Well, for instance, Similase from Integrative Therapeutics, you know, it has some sucrase and some lactase and a few other uh, starch digestive enzymes. So, you know, sometimes they'll just kind of pepper it with, with some of those. And remember, the brush border enzymes are the second phase because the pancreatic enzymes start the process and then the brush border enzymes finish the digestion of oligosaccharides, especially disaccharides. And if you don't fully digest the disaccharides because you have a brush border enzyme deficiency, you're going to end up with massive bacterial overgrowth because you're feeding the bacteria all that sugar because you're not absorbing it. Ro Roxanne Yana um, informed us that the Apex product is known as gluten flam. Gluten flam might might be one of them. They have another one that isn't um, isn't so much for the inflammation, but is more of a digestive enzyme. Okay. They may have several of them. Okay, that might be one of them. Um, yeah. So that's pancreas, and then. You, want to, you may need to evaluate hormones, especially adrenal steroids and melatonin. Um, I use the Dutch test often, and it measures melatonin levels, but Diagnostex Lab also does a melatonin along with their adrenal steroids. Um, that could be a whole nother discussion right there about how important that is. Uh, you want to rule out Hydrogen SIBO and methane IMO, which is intestinal methanogen overgrowth. For many years, we, we used to call uh, methane uh, a type of SIBO, but because methane isn't made by bacteria, it's made by archaea, we always felt funny about saying small intestine bacterial overgrowth methane uh, type because it's not made by bacteria. So now we call it intestinal methanogen overgrowth when it's uh, elevated methane. And then of course, food sensitivities, including gluten or lactose intolerance are, can be major causes of heartburn. And a lot of patients will tell you, oh yeah, I got diagnosed with celiac disease. I stopped eating gluten and my terrible heartburn went away. I don't have to take any medicine anymore. Of course, you can evaluate gastric pH directly with the Heidelberg test. We do that in my office and we were talking earlier about Sam Rabar down in LA uh, uses that in his office as well. You can do a trial with uh, acid, uh, you know, apple cider vinegar or bitters or betaine hydrochloride in a careful way and see uh, if that dramatically improves their reflux. Then you know that uh, they're probably hypochlorhydric. Uh, the, the cool thing about the Heidelberg test is if you find that the patient that directly measures the pH of the stomach through a capsule, a radio telemetry capsule, and sends that message out to uh, the computer and gives you a graph in near real time. And uh, if you find the patient is hypochlorhydric, you can give them bitters and see what happens to the pH. And we've found that a lot of patients, it'll, it'll drop their pH by as much as two pH points when you put the 
the bidders in there so you can see if it works for them or not. And if it doesn't, then you can do a trial, you know, after 20 minutes or so, you can do a trial with a uh, hydrochloric acid capsule or two, have them swallow that and see what it does for the pH. So uh, we just got a Heidelberg test back two weeks ago. It was fascinating because the patient had this sawtooth pattern. Their pH was just bobbing up and down throughout the entire test. And it was, it was bobbing up quite a bit. So we knew they had hypochlorhydria, but that sawtooth pattern usually indicates that the pyloric valve isn't functioning properly and they're getting reflux of bile and alkalinity into the stomach. So you see the acidity and the alkalinity, it just goes up and down like that. They gave that patient, um, I think it was the wise woman um, liquid bitters as a trial during the test. And for 15 to 20 minutes, perfectly calm. There was no up and down at all. It was such a great response. You could tell that woman really needs bitters. It didn't acidify though. She still had a pH of four and anything above three is hypochlorhydria. So she's going to need something more to get some acidity in there. But it was remarkable what it did for that sawtooth uh, pyloric valve reflux. By the way, are herbal bitters best uh, effective at stimulating bile flow, hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes, or all of the above? I would say all of the above. And, and from what I saw last week or two, uh, helping with pyloric valve tone as well. It's, it's just kind of a general um, tonification for the whole upper GI tract. And remember, there are bitter taste receptors throughout the entire digestive tract, even in the colon. And you might think, well, that's ridiculous. Why do you need to taste bitter things down there? Well, <laughs> it turns out they do so much more than just taste bitter but that's the first thing that was discovered. So they called them bitter taste receptors, but they do, you know, so many important things. And they're also found in any tissue. Uh, I believe most tissues that change shape, like I think blood vessels have them and the lungs might have them. Bitter taste receptors are present in lots of tissues. So I would say, uh, you know, bitters, they might do almost anything they just help normalize function if they work for the patient. Okay. So they might have hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria. They might have normal acid. They might have excessive acid. And you, you, know, you can check for that if you, if you want to do that. And it's a great thing to do if your patient has pretty persistent reflux. Because um, you want to know if it's weakly acid or acidic or even neutral or alkaline reflux. And then you may need to evaluate for the, the GI flora, especially to check for overgrowth. And uh, you know, you could, I, I list over some of the tests that can be used over on the side. And I don't do a lot of testing for H. pylori, but if they have ulcer-like symptoms, you know, severe epigastric pain or a lot of nausea and vomiting, or if they've been shown to have uh, ulcers or, or uh, recurrent gastritis, uh, you know, checking for H. pylori and treating it uh, may be an important thing to do. Uh, a lot of H. pylori is just commensal. So I, I really discourage practitioners from checking for H. pylori unless the patient has ulcer-like symptoms. Now, there are a few other well-proven H. pylori related diseases, but H. pylori is mostly a commensal organism. It is the most important uh, gastrobiome. It's like the center of the gastrobiome. And it's very important for maturing the immune system in the newborn in the first few years of life. So it's unfortunate that less than 5% of kids have H. pylori in their stomach nowadays. And that's why, you know, research shows that there's increased risk of Crohn's disease, 
increased risk of reflux and Barrett's esophagus if you don't have H. pylori in your stomach when you're a kid, uh, increased risk of food sensitivities, increased risk of the allergic triad, asthma, hay fever, and eczema, and even laryngeal cancer. The list is kind of crazy how, how protective H. pylori is, especially for kids in the first five or 10 years of life. It tends to be more problematic you know, in people as they get older, and we're not exactly sure why, but there's some virulence factors, CAG A and CAG B and certain others, that by the way, the only lab that checks for those is the GI MAP stool test. Uh, otherwise it's just considered, uh, those virulence factors are considered to be uh, research only. And I'm not so sure it's that helpful because knowing which virulence factors they have may not really tell you much, except that if they have significant virulence factors, I think it's less likely to be commensal and more likely to be path pathologic. So, so your recommendation, if we see overgrowth of H. pylori on like a GI map stool test, um, even if there's virulence factors, uh, unless there's symptoms indicative of uh, an ulcer, you would tend not to treat. Yeah, uh, with a caveat. So definitely, I mean, if you find several virulence factors, you know, discuss it with the patient and or their gastroenterologist and decide if you want to treat it. But how about no virulence factors, but maybe it's the only thing that's significantly positive on their stool test and it's, you know, out of range. Well, okay. So if this is a patient, here's the thing. I would say always treat H. pylori if you find it, if you know the patient has gastric lymphoma. It's also called maltoma because, you know, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue is, is the lymph tissue that has the lymphoma. Lymphoma of the stomach or maltoma is an incredible, has an incredible response rate to treating H. pylori, if the patient has both H. pylori positive and gastric maltoma. The, the tumor literally melts away when you treat the H. pylori. Uh, it's like an 84% success rate. Wow. So I would always suggest treating that. Okay. You know? But outside of that have, extremely rare case. Yeah. If they don't have, yeah, and, and I taught pathology for 17 years, so I'm a, a, a who's who of rare diseases. <laughs> if you want to talk about zebras. But anyway, um, that's not what we're going to talk about. Um, there's also, there are some patients that have chronic iron deficiency anemia that responds to nothing, you know, and they get, they get, treated with IV iron and whoa, well, they feel terrific and they feel better for about three or four months. And then it all goes away, like it drains out and their ferritin's at eight again, you know, rock bottom. Uh, if they have a positive H. pylori and you treat that, there was several research studies that showed that within nine months is something like 75% are no longer iron deficient and no longer anemic. And by 12 months after treatment, and they don't have to take iron. It's just wow. treating the H. pylori. Because the H. pylori steals iron for its own metabolism. And that's where, that's where this comes from. It also, H. pylori can also cause hypochlorhydria, uh, one form of it. Uh, there, there's some forms that... Uh, well, I don't want to get into it, but if it's if the H. pylori gastritis is specifically in the antrum, antral uh, dominant, then that tends to cause hyperchlorhydria. But if it's pangastritis and it's affecting the entire stomach lining, it tends to cause hypochlorhydria. So that you know, hypochlorhydria certainly is a cause of iron deficiency. So that might be part of the mechanism too. Uh, one more question on H. pylori: If we see um, antibodies to H. pylori, doesn't that mean that we should treat it? Well, uh, so there are 
at least three ways to check for H. pylori, right? There's the blood antibodies, IgG. There's stool antigen. And there's the breath test. There's an H. pylori breath test. The H. pylori breath test and the stool test tell you H. pylori is currently present in the gut. But if you check the blood and you find an elevated antibody, that tells you they've been, they've had H. pylori at some point in their life. And that's becoming less and less common, like we said, because of antibiotics and other treatments uh, slowly eroding the, the levels of H. pylori and people being treated for H. pylori so they don't have it. Moms don't have it to give to their kids. Um, so uh, the question is, if you have antibodies, you should treat it. Well, that's the standard approach. It's called test and treat, meaning if you find it, you treat it. And that's why I'm telling you, don't test everybody for it. You know, don't do a stool test that, like the GI map, it checks everybody for H. pylori, stool antigen. I think it's actually stool DNA is what they test, yes. which is yeah. a unique test. It's not a standard test. So I would verify it. If you, if you get a positive there, I would verify it with a stool antigen or a H. pylori breath test or even a, a blood antibody test. The thing about the blood antibody test is it doesn't necessarily normalize if you've treated H. pylori effectively. It's not a good follow-up test to see if things have normalized. The stool test and the breath test will normalize if the H. pylori was eradicated, but the antibody may persist. It's an IgG, so it can persist for a long time. So unless you know um, that they've never been treated for H. pylori and there's some other risk factor like iron deficiency anemia that's not responding to anything or you know, ulcers that keep recurring or chronic gastritis, um, you know, I just say, think about it before you treat it. And your the favorite standard approach is test and treat. So and if you, treat, if you test, you're kind of expected to treat. So don't test everybody. And your favorite treatment, do you use the triple antibiotic therapy or do you use uh, mastic gum? Do you use? I never, I never treat it anymore because oh, okay. every, since 1995, every, MD and osteopath, everybody treats it whenever they, whenever they find it on a test. So it's very rare. The only cases I usually see now are people who have, you know, most of the patients I see have already been to at least one, if not two or three gastroenterologists already. So that's all be, that's been picked off. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you, if, if I were going to treat a patient for H. pylori, I would use triple therapy, and I would for seven, you know, 10 to 14 days nowadays, it used to be seven. And I would add lactoferrin, at least 300 milligrams, three times a day during the treatment, because that increases the effectiveness. I would add a biofilm disruptor, the simplest one, of course, being NAC. And there've been several studies showing that uh, antibiotic resistant H. pylori when you add NAC to break down the biofilm, you get a much higher response rate. So I do those things and I add a probiotic because probiotics together with triple therapy have been found to increase the success rate. So if you're going to give them two antibiotics plus a proton pump inhibitor, give them these three extra things, which can really improve the effectiveness. And uh, I think I, I made one more slide because I wanted to make sure everybody knows about cut out the crap. This is a handout. I have a GERD handout that I give to all my patients that have reflux to remind them the things that are commonly triggers and, ca and causes. So these are the things I want them to do trials with uh, if they're using these things or, or these are things that are, are going on in their life. So C stands for coffee, 
caffeine in general. So, you know, could include uh, energy drinks and things, cigarettes and chocolate. So methylxanthines in general, but especially chocolate and, and caffeine um, and smoking. Can we say, you know, n a number of mechanisms by which tobacco smoking can uh, affect reflux and perhaps even a patch or chewing tobacco as well. And chewing tobacco, of course, is horrible for cancer of the mouth. Um, and so they can do trials removing these things. And if it turns out coffee, without coffee, they don't have any reflux, you can have them do a trial with acid, low acid coffee. Um, there are several brands. One is called Tyler's brand uh, that are sold in some stores. And it's a very, they, they reduce the amount of acid in it. And that can really help people with reflux be able to drink some coffee if they really like coffee. What was that about um, chewing gum causing cancer in the mouth? Uh, not chewing gum, chewing tobacco. Oh, chewing tobacco. Okay. You know, as a cause of leukoplakia. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Yep, yep. R stands for refined carbohydrates. And then I put in, and this comes from Sherry Rogers' book, No More Heartburn, but I added some things. I reworked it a little bit. So refined carbohydrates, but also any carbohydrates. So we find that low fermentation diets like fast track diet and uh, SIBO type diets and uh, Cedar sinai diet and FODMAPs diet sometimes are remarkably effective at treating reflux just by themselves, just by reducing the total amount of carbohydrate, fermentable carbohydrate per meal. Uh, I put RX in there for drugs because there's a whole, I have a slide when I do my full lecture on reflux uh, that all the drugs on the left that can irritate the esophagus and cause uh, erosive esophagitis and all the drugs on, on the right that can um, uh, trigger more reflux in a patient who already has reflux. Things, uh, often things that are antispasmodic and relax the lower esophageal sphincter or delay gastric emptying. And then R is for rapid eating, fletcherizing, chewing food until it's liquid, taking your time in a relaxed manner. That can totally cure your patient's reflux, a lot of your patients. It also tends to promote parasympathetic tone. So you're gonna have more vagal tone, you're gonna have more uh, improved digestion on many, many levels. So please don't forget that if your patient is a shoveler, you know, if they eat their meals in, in five minutes, if they eat at their desk while they're doing work on their computer and they don't even know that they're finished because, you know, they ate so fast, you got to work with that. That's, that's really important. By the way, are there any, do you have any tricks to help in patients, uh, improve at that? Well, I got to put in a plug. My wife is a neurofeedback practitioner, biofeedback practitioner, and a, a stress coach, stress management coach. And she recently wrote a series of six blog articles that I would highly recommend everybody read uh, on our website, hmmpdx.com, which is on there, a uh, hive mind medicine website. And uh, you go to our blog page and she wrote six blogs. One of them is specifically on chewing and why that's so important. And she even, I didn't even know about this till I read her article that the trigeminal nerve, which controls mastication in large part, uh, actually when it, uh, when the brain perceives through the trigeminal nerve that you're chewing your food and taking your time and thoroughly chewing, it sends a message to the brainstem that calms the nervous system, autonomic nervous system, and turns on the parasympathetics. So, yeah, it's, I just, it's so great, the stuff that she writes. So I just highly recommend it's free and it's on our website and you can recommend it to your patients to read them. Uh, just really cool. cool. And uh, A in crap, A is for, Acidic foods, because some people, 
you know, if they cut out tomatoes and, and nightshades, especially, uh, especially tomatoes, um, personally, it's white, white potatoes for me. It's that nightshade. That's the only food that gives me reflux. I don't ever have reflux now because I just don't eat white potatoes. So, you know, food allergies can be a thing. And that's why I have allergenic foods there. If you know someone's, you know, sensitive or allergic to a food, that can be a big trigger for reflux. By the way, or, you have a, do you have a favorite food sensitivity uh, test? You know, I hardly ever do food sensitivity testing. I used to do a lot of it. I actually worked at a lab that did cytotoxic leukocyte testing. And I would see those patients and go over their lab results. But, you know, because so many of my patients have bacterial overgrowth now, and I'm putting them on specific carbohydrate diet or Dr. C. Becker's uh, SIBO specific food guide, which is related to a specific carbohydrate diet. You know, I kind of use that as sort of an elimination diet initially and see, see how much better they get. A lot of times their, their reflux goes away just when they're on that diet. And it's part of our treatment for bacterial overgrowth. You know, a low fermentation diet. So I, I don't do a lot of that kind of food sensitivity testing, uh, but a lot of my patients come having already had those tests and it's, so I don't have to do it because they already had one recently and that's really helpful. And I mentioned apple fat, pregnancy or apple, apple fat, uh, increasing intra-abdominal pressure. Not that it's easy to get rid of that and apple fat is a major cause of insulin sensitivity and that's where the adrenals come in with uh, treating someone's uh, either bacterial overgrowth or reflux, uh, because I find that adrenal maladaption with especially high cortisol and low DHEA, that ratio being off, really can promote insulin resistance and cause people to accumulate fat, uh, visceral fat around the waist, which triggers more reflux. Um, P is for pop or soda pop because soda seems to be a big one for some people. Peppermint, oops, sorry. Peppermint because it's a smooth muscle relaxant probably, really strong peppermint. Like after dinner mints <laughs> can be a, a just murder for some people with reflux. Altoids, you know, curiously strong menthol. Um, even though it's great for people with cramps, abdominal cramps, you know, sometimes it's enterically coated peppermint can be a terrific smooth muscle relaxant. And it's the only smooth muscle relaxant that doesn't promote bacterial overgrowth. It actually can treat, uh, be part of the treatment for hydrogen SIBO. But, uh, but it can relax the lower esophageal sphincter for some people. So something to consider. And I, this is one I added in also packing in food at bedtime, right? So, you know, you really want them to finish eating at least three hours and don't have a huge meal at dinner time. You know, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper or a queen and a princess and a pauper or they, you know, depending on your your approach. It, and then, it, it's interesting that one of the current trends in functional medicine is intermittent fasting. And the way that most people do it is they skip breakfast. So yeah. they end up eating a bigger dinner because of it. Yeah. I mean, that can work for a lot of people. Um, certainly having a light dinner at least three hours before you go to bed. And then if you want to, you know, eat breakfast later, um, that's probably a, a better way for some people. You're right. And then the last one is progesterone. Most women don't produce too much progesterone, but they might be taking uh, higher doses of progesterone, like 200 milligrams or higher. And we know progesterone is a smooth muscle relaxant. So that could uh, at least theoretically be a problem for some, some women. I don't see it very often. But it's certainly a problem in pregnancy because progesterone levels go sky high in pregnancy. That's, you know, a normal pregnancy. Uh, women that aren't prone to uh, miscarriage. So that's, that's the cut out the crap. Things to, uh, 
you, you will become a reflux treating genius to your patients if you just really pay attention to this and, you know, have them go through whatever they're doing and do a trial without it. Um, it this could really, if I said nothing else tonight, this is gold. It's crap, but it's gold. <laughs> if, you, if you have a patient with high acid and they have reflux, are there um, specific products that you like to use besides looking for the underlying causes like SIBO and food sensitivities and these other things? Are there certain nutritional products that you like to use as part of the treatment that could at least help symptomatically on a short term? Well, certainly all the demulsants can be helpful and worth trying, whether it's slippery elm or marshmallow root or DGL. Um, and, you know, slippery elm gruel is a really nice one. Just mixing the powder with enough water to make kind of a paste and taking up to four tablespoons of that, it can just be remarkably relieving in like within minutes. Um, I would also say if you're not a homeopath, consider the, the remedy Nux Vomica. If it, if it fits a few other things for your patient besides their uh, severe reflux, especially in people who have tended to overdo it, like people who drink too much alcohol, take too many drugs, overeat, uh, you know, that overdo everything and people that overwork, workaholics, um, if they have severe reflux, Nux Vomica as a homeopathic remedy can really be the end of their reflux. So that's another one to consider besides the demulsants. And I have to say that, um, you know, if your patient has LPR that we talked about, a lot of patients with laryngopharyngeal reflux that reflux up here, they will wake up, you'll think they have PTSD because they'll wake out of sleep gasping for breath, you know, or you think they have asthma or something. And it turns out it's just that their, their vocal cords and their pharynx are swollen and edematous from the reflux, especially when they're lying down at night, you know, they're more likely to have reflux up into their throat. And some of those patients, I'll, I'll pick uh, the lowest dose of famotidine, which is over the counter. Uh, the old, you know, before proton pump inhibitors, there was Tagamet and other drugs that are called H2 receptor antagonists. And I mean, if, if you're waking up feeling like you're dying, and you can't sleep because you're scared if you go to sleep, you will stop breathing. I mean, these people end up in terrible shape. So if you know they have LPR, um, if you need to, you may, you may wanna have them on famotidine at least until you figure out something else to deal with the cause of the reflux. Yeah, I, I sometimes will use a, a product from Gaia Herbs called Reflux Relief and I have them chew two of those and Really, really nice product to help. For LPR or just for reflux in general? Just for the reflux, yeah. yeah. There's also a, a newer product called Heartburn. Oh, I always forget the names of these things. Heartburn um, Advantage. It's made by Integrative Therapeutics. And it's a combination of herbal prokinetics. So especially if your patient has delayed gastric emptying, if they have type two or type one diabetes or even pre-diabetes or some other cause of delayed gastric emptying. Um, so it has herbal prokinetics and it has some demulsants, I think uh, DGL in there as well. And so that may be really helpful as well. Some promotility and some demulsant activity. You ever use Pepto-Bismol? Uh, yeah, I use almost everything, you know, when I have to. Um, yeah, bismuth is, that's over-the-counter bismuth. And, you know, except for the flavor and the artificial sugar that might be in there, you can just, you can just uh, have people get, um, if they're going to take it for any length of time, bismuth subsalicylate or bismuth 
subnitrate. And especially if they're salicylate sensitive, you know, if they have nasal polyps or asthma and they're aspirin sensitive, then you'd want to use the bismuth subnitrate. But um, that, can, that can sometimes be real healing for ulcers and erosions and, um, and reflux. So, um, you know, it's just another demulsant. Cool. Well, this was an incredible discussion, Dr. SSL. Lots of clinical pearls. Um, yeah, it's dangerous to start asking me questions about things that I love to talk about. <laughs> By the way, I'm writing, I, I'm taking two weeks off the end of the year to finally finish my book on reflux. Oh, cool. And, you know, we'll, we'll make an announcement on our website about it, but it's, uh, it's called Getting Real About Reflux. And it'll cover all these things and more details. Um, it'll, I, I'm, trying to make it a book that lay people can read your patients can read as well as doctors can learn a ton from and uh, I've never written a book like that before so it's taken me a little longer than just writing for doctors but uh, yeah I'm going to take some time off and really try to get it done and I hope it'll we'll have it done um, going through the uh, editing phase by summer so that's coming up Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you everybody for um, joining us and um, happy holidays. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in 2021.